Our scripture comes from John, it is verses 35 to 46. The next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he had said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which translated to teacher, Where are you staying? He replied, Come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard of what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated to Peter. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, Follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip followed Nathanael and said to him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the Law and the Prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son, from Nazareth. Nathanael responded, Can anything from Nazareth be good? Philip said, Come and see. May the fount of wisdom bless the words we have read and plant them deeply in our minds, our hearts, and our lives. Amen. So practices. <laughs> practices to make possible. You'd think we've practiced this enough that I would know what the order is, that since I write the order, you'd think, but what can I tell you? <laughs> yes, very, 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 very human. Practices make possible. We've been talking about that and why. How? How do practices make possible? Well, because practices are actions within our power by which we become capable of things currently beyond our power. We know this. We live this in every day and every way. Any skill that we have, any hobby that we, that we participate in, any musical instrument or, or sport or most anything we do. Reading, you know, it's not even just like activities like that, but almost anything we do, we learn to do it. We don't inherently know how to do it. We get to the point where we can do those things through practice. Right? And not just things, but people. I don't know, I hope that none of us are content with who we are today. Maybe content, but, are, but always striving to be a little more, a little better, a little more like Jesus. The life of faith is just that, a way of life, not a destination. Right? And in that way of life, we're continually striving to grow, to be more and better, more goodness. And how do we do that? Of course, through practices. We aren't quite yet the people we want to be. And we get to be those people through practices because they make it possible for us to become people we currently are incapable of being. So what are those practices that we, that we are talking about? Well. We all just gave it. We heard uh, twice when our new members committed to those five methods uh, of discipleship, and we all did too in response. You know them all now, right? Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Right? And we've been transforming those methods into practices. We start with one that's not on the list, and that's opening. And we said we have to practice opening because if we're not open to the movement of God's Spirit, then really none of the rest of this is possible. That, that first practice is opening. And we've been symbolizing that with closed fists. If you, if you go to greet someone with closed fists, what are you most likely to do? What are you capable of doing with closed fists? Punching, hitting. If you greet someone with open hands, what kind of a difference does that make? Now, I've been told that uh, in the past, some have been greeted for their first time here by uh, somebody in the church running up and grabbing and giving them a very big hug on the very first time they came in. I will admit to you, I'm not quite comfortable doing that, and probably for the best, but we will commit to having an open hand to go with our open hearts and our open minds and our open doors. Our first practice is the practice of opening to the possibilities of how God's Spirit might be calling us. When we talk about praying, the practice of praying, 
we have, it's, it's easy for me, at least, to collect lots of books about praying. It's harder to actually practice praying. They aren't the same thing, but we know there are a wide variety of methods of praying. We challenge you to practice some of them consistently. We talked about serving, the practice of serving. We're in the habit of feeding folks in this place. It's endemic to who we are. And so one of the best ways that we do that, when we're, the practice of serving, is caring for neighbors in need. Through things like our Helping Hands Food Pantry, in collaboration with St. Mary's Parish, or Work at Daybreak, where we provide food for neighbors who are hungry. And one of the best gifts that you can give the pantry, of course, is easily consumed protein. So not, a, not an accident what we grab there. Right? And we said we're going to practice gathering. Remember the challenges for that? We said, one, we, we challenge you to commit to the idea that if you're, as long as you're not sick or away, gather with us, in person or online. Gather with us. Commit to gathering regularly. And then, the further challenge of, we want everyone in church gathering and growing in a group. And we have a lot of different small groups to happen. That those, We believe that when we're open to uh, being in small groups together, and we practice being in those small groups, symbolized by our, all of our lovely cards about so many of our groups. When we do that, that's an opportunity to care for one another and be cared for by one another. That's so often where we become the people we're striving to be, a little closer to being the people we strive to be. So the practice of gathering. And last week we talked about the practice of giving, symbolized by the game that I was playing, where I was playing the wrong game. I was playing by the wrong rules of the game, and we find when we play by the rules that Jesus suggests, that generosity, the practice of generosity, yeah, it makes sure, the, especially the practice of our financial generosity, makes the mission and ministry of this place possible, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, changes us. One of the paradoxes of generosity, the practice of giving, is that we find when we give that we receive just as much or more. We become the people we want to be when we practice giving. And so that leaves witness. What practice should we name witnessing? Well, I'll be honest, we know that the, wit the practice of witnessing is the scariest one of them all. As much as we all dislike that talk about money, we're going to really, really dislike, because it terrifies us, the practice of witnessing. So what shall we call it? What shall we name this witness? I'll tell you what we're not going to call it. We're not going to call it evangelizing. And here's why. Because that word has been so co-opted. I don't know about you, but for me, in my experience, evangelism feels like something where it's like, cold calling on your door because they want to hand you a track or they want to convince you of, of something. They don't really, in, in practice, I know they don't mean it like this, but in practice it comes out where they don't really care about you or me. They care about checking the box that they've done the thing. Now, there's plenty of history, uh, examples in history where you can take a word and repurpose it, right? Where you can reclaim a word. The entire Methodist movement is one like that. That way back in the day, John Wesley and his brother John uh, Charles, when they were at college and they were starting what would become the Methodist movement, they had a particular way of going about it. They had, they had a, kind of a regimented procedure for questions they would ask and ways they would read text. And, and so their fellow students would see them doing this and they would use that Methodist term to mock them. Like, oh, those Methodists, right? They just, they had this strict method. And eventually, as sometimes happens, that name got adopted and became what we call the movement. The United Met now the United Methodist denomination comes from that movement where they repurposed or reclaimed that name. My friends, at least as far as I can feel, like I don't think we can renew. I think it's too far gone. Evangelizing as a term. Not as a thing that we do, but as a term. Let me tell you when I was in high school, I was at a camp, a Fellowship Christian Athletes camp, and part of what we had to do, kind of our big, uh, the big finale, was we were put in groups of three, 
and set out into the, into the little town that was nearby and asked to go around and, and knock on doors, ring doorbells, and asked whoever answered, if you died tonight, how certain are you that you would be in heaven? Yeah, I says, yeah, that's a cringeworthy now, sure, yes, exactly, but let's, and I, I, I'll give the benefit of the doubt as much as I can. I think whoever came up with that had goodness and in heart, but in practice, oh my goodness, it's so invasive, it's so arrogant in the question and in the presumed response, and frankly, it doesn't really care about that person. It was just like, hey, we gotta go as many as many doors as we can. It wasn't really, we weren't told to be interested in the story of whatever the person was that told us that, that answered the door. We just needed to check that box. So perhaps I'm letting my own personal experience uh, cloud this too much, but I'm going to say we're not going to call it evangelizing for that and so many other reasons. So what shall we name this practice? Well, as you probably gathered by now, inviting. Practice inviting. My friends, how many of you found out about this church because somebody invited you to come? Yeah, at least a few of you. Right. Donna, okay, Donna, our new member, Donna, came because Evan invited her co-worker, invited her. And she became part of our, officially part of our body today. Mary told us that uh, Skeptic Circle this week that she started coming to this church because somebody invited her. 50-some years ago, somebody invited her. And then this week, she invited somebody to come to Skeptic Circuit with her. The practice of inviting is how we witness. We do this in the other areas of our life all the time. You try out a new restaurant, and you say, hey, that was really great. You ask a friend, hey, we're going again. You should come with. Check it out. How many times you say, oh, well, you want to see the new movie? Should, is it good? Yeah, you should go see it. Or no, you really shouldn't. I invite you to save your time and money and not go see that one. <laughs> Just this week, a family friend reached out and invited me to go to Iowa City yesterday. Our, our sons um, went to high school together, played baseball together, and are now both at the University of Iowa. And this week, friend Ed I called up and said, hey, got an extra ticket. I'm just going up for, for the day and coming back. Do you want to go see your son and go watch the football game? And I said, absolutely. I never would have had that opportunity had he not invited me. My friends, we do this all the time. We understand inherently the importance and the power of practicing invitation. So why does it feel so scary to do it to church, to invite somebody to church? Well, I get why it is. So let's look at that last part of the scripture that I, I deign to let us read today. <laughs> Thank you, Val, for reading that. The next day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to Philip, follow me. And Philip found Nathanael. And said, hey, we found the one we want to follow. It's Jesus from Nazareth. And Nathanael said, Really? Nazareth? Can anything good possibly come from Nazareth? And how did Philip respond? He didn't defend Jesus. He didn't feel offended and be like, oh my gosh, how could you possibly disparage this person that I just met? He didn't defend anyone. He didn't even really try to answer the question. He just said, what? Come and see. In other words, he said, Philip said to Nathaniel, he, he didn't balk at his questions, he didn't balk at the, you know, Nathaniel's skeptical, it's fine to be skeptical. Essentially, Philip said, let's find out together. Isn't that really what inviting folks to church is about? Let's, whatever your questions are, whatever your skepticism is, it's fine, let's find out together if this place has something to say to you. Notice, too, that Jesus needed Philip to share that invitation. 
Even Jesus couldn't do all the inviting by himself, evidenced by the fact he didn't even try. Jesus needed Philip's voice, and my friends, I believe Jesus needs our voice, yours and mine and ours together, to practice inviting. Because we know that people need good news, need to know that change in their life is possible. But I think too many people don't know where to find it. So we look around our society, we see so much hate, so much division, so much scapegoating. We think, where is truth, or beauty, or goodness, or generosity, or justice for the oppressed? Where do we find those things in this life? And I believe we have an answer to that. We have a response. We have a small community trying to embody those very things. We have to practice inviting them, because the truth is, too many people don't know that good news and change can happen in church. They're saying they don't know that because it's our fault they don't know that. And people like Nathaniel say, can anything good come from church? So many casual viewers only know about church, only know about Jesus from the loudest voices in our culture. Right? Voices that seem to only offer bigotry or hate or exclusion. Voices that are, seem to offer pain and rejection in the face of suffering. Voices that add more violence physically and verbally to a world already overwhelmed by violence. Too many of the loudest voices about church and about Jesus offer pain and cruelty so much so it seems that cruelty must be the point for them. My friends, we've earned the reputation because the loudest voices say, seem to say the worst things. There's a thread on Reddit under the title of Crazy Things Christians Have Said to Me. I gotta tell you, I was hoping for some funny stuff in that. But mostly it's just sad and enraging. Things like well, the pastor said that the attacks on 9-11 and hurricanes are God's judgment on the United States for being too permissive. Or somebody said, well, my preferred political candidate is the Messiah and here to save us from, from our own evil. Or one told my mom that my autism was due to her sin before I was born. Or crazy things like dinosaurs aren't real, or, you know, their remains were just put here to test our faith in some weird way that makes no sense. Or, we should jail people for being gay. Friends, I was hoping for something funny, and it was all just awful. We can't let those be the only voices people hear. Jesus needs our voice because people need to know that good things are possible. And change is possible. And God wants good things for them. And that this is a place where we strive to live those better ways. Not dogma, not a bunch of guilt, certainly not shame. Shame does nobody, it does no good for anyone. Not really a bunch of rules to follow. Not a bunch of weird rituals. Well, okay, maybe a few weird rituals. I mean, let's be honest. Right? But a place to belong place where forgiveness and hope and joy and friendship and a found family are practiced, are who we are and who we're striving to be in the world through these practices. So we put them all together. We've got these practices of opening and praying and giving and gathering and serving. And maybe on the top is the practice of inviting. All that really means is having a conversation. It's just having a conversation. It doesn't have to be this fraught thing where, oh my gosh, the, the, the entirety of your future existence relies on me having the exact right thing to say in the exact right order at the exact right time. My friends, it's not that hard. It's scary, but it's not, it's not complex. It's just having a conversation. 
conversation. Inviting somebody to cup of coffee or, you know, if you must, tea. <laughs> Just invite somebody to have a conversation. In our grief group this week, we shared stories of loss that brought the stories of loss that brought us to that group, and we discovered that each one's grief is unique. And yet, there are threads in each of our stories that connect and bring us a little closer together. It's just a conversation. The practice of inviting. It's just a conversation. So our challenge today, to be people who don't see our faith as something merely personal and private, but as something good to be shared, something worth inviting others to practice to. So my friends, as you look through the rest of this year and into 2025, I ask you to ask yourselves this, to wrestle with this question, to what commitments will you make? What commitments will you make to the practices that we've been talking about? What commitments will you make to the practices of opening, of praying, of serving, of gathering, of giving, and of inviting? Starting next week, we're going to give you a, a physical piece of paper kind of thing as a way to track that, as a way to make a commitment and track how you're doing with that. What commitments will you make to the practices that we've been talking about? Opening and praying and serving and gathering and giving and inviting. To close, I leave you with Maya Angelou's poem, Alone. She writes, thinking last night how to find my soul a home, where water is not thirsty and bread, of, bread loaf is not stone, I came up with one thing, and I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. There are some millionaires with money they can't use. Their wives round, run around like banshees. Their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone, but nobody, no nobody, can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering, the wind is gonna blow, the race of man is suffering, and I can hear the moan, because nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. My friends, so many of our neighbors are searching for a community that will care about them no matter who they are or where they're from or whom they love. So many of our neighbors are searching for a community that will help them find purpose and meaning. And if you believe like I believe that you all, we together, this place, this found family, has an answer to those longings, then I invite you, I challenge you to join me in the practice of inviting. Amen? Amen. Amen. May it be so.